On October 12, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 took off from Montevideo, Uruguay, with 45 people on board, 40 passengers and 5 crew members, with most of the people on board being in their late teens and early 20s. The plane was being chartered by the Old Christians Club amateur rugby team in order to transport the team's players, friends and family members to Santiago, Chile for an exhibition match. However, due to the torrid weather conditions over Argentina at the time, the plane was forced to make an emergency landing in the small providence of Mendoza until it was safe to continue on its path to Santiago. Few of the passengers gave way to the dangers that this journey began to present itself. In order to reach Santiago from Mendoza, the plane would have to bypass the heart of the Andes Mountains, the highest peak in the world next to the Himalayas. The inexperienced Lieutenant Dante Hector was to pilot the aircraft the following afternoon, when the conditions were expected to improve. On Friday, October the 13th, a little over an hour into the flight back to Santiago, Hector and his co-pilot Julio Cesar Freitas mistakenly judged the location of the plane. Due to heavy cloud coverage at an altitude of 18,000 feet, the pilots could not visually confirm their location from the terrain below. Around 3.21 p.m., pilot Hector radioed air traffic control in Santiago requesting permission to land, and with clearance from air traffic control began to descend before the plane had entirely made it out of the Andes. Upon regaining visual flight conditions, the pilot finally saw the mountain and unsuccessfully tried to regain altitude. Unable to clear the ridge line, the plane struck the mountain, losing both its wings and tail upon impact. The front end of the plane then slid down the mountain before landing in a valley at an altitude of approximately 12,000 feet. The initial crash killed 12 people and left a number of 33 surviving passengers injured with five more people dying within the first few hours of the incident, leaving 28 still alive, stranded on top of the Andes. The Chilean Air Search and Rescue Service was notified within the hour that the flight had disappeared and sent four planes to search until the night descended. On the second day, 11 aircrafts from Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay searched for the missing flight. Coincidentally, the search teams actually covered the accident location and most of the aircrafts even overflew the crash site. The remaining survivors were able to see the numerous planes flying overhead and desperately try to get their attention. But the authorities were unable to spot the white plane wreckage amidst the frosty bitter terrain of the Andes. The remaining 28 survivors removed the broken seats and other debris to fashion the fuselage into a crude makeshift shelter. Using the luggage and seats to close off the rear of the fuselage, the captain of the rugby team, 25-year-old Marcelo Perez, took a leadership role in the coming days. The survivors had a hard time during the nights when temperatures plunged below negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. All the boys on board had lived their entire lives by the coast, and some had never even seen snow before the crash. None had any high-altitude survival experience to speak of. They lacked medical supplies, cold-weather clothing, and equipment and food. 20-year-old Roy Harley recovered a small transitor radio from the plane and improvised a long antenna using electrical wire, and on the 11th grueling day atop the mountain heard the terrifying news. It was presumed that everybody on Flight 571 out of Uruguay was deceased and no more search teams would be sent to look for them. Roberto Canessa, a 19-year-old med student, described the scene. I felt that the world was going on its way and that we were out of it now. It's a very strange sensation to be alive but to be considered dead. That moment shook us in the sense that waiting for rescue was over. Gustavo Nikolic climbed through the hole in the wall of suitcases and rugby shirts and looked at all the mournful faces that stared back at him. As the hopelessness of their predicament began to envelop them, he shouted, Hey boys, there's some good news we just heard on the radio. They called off the search. 
Why the hell is that good news another shouted back at him? Because it means we're gonna get out of here on our own. The portrayal of survival in popular media is often merely for artistic purposes. There's no way to explain how an individual arrives to such decisions when their life is in immediate danger. Knowing that the rescue efforts had been called off, and death from starvation was rapidly becoming a greater concern, the survivors gave each other the permission to use their bodies for food in the case that would be the next to perish. Left with no other alternatives, the survivors began to consume the bodies of their deceased friends and relatives. Even though evidence of cannibalism in humans dates back millennia, for most civilized societies, it is an unthinkable act relegated to the domain of horror films and literature. However, for the passengers of Flight 571, it became the reality. The religious conviction of the Catholic Uruguayans led many to struggle with the idea of eating human flesh. Many of them cited John 5.13 to ease their conscience and quiet their hunger. No man hath greater love than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. On October the 29th, 17 days after the initial crash, an avalanche struck the fuselage while the survivors were still inside almost completely filling the fuselage with snow and ice and smothering eight people to death, including Gustavo Nikolic, team captain Marcelo Perez, and a woman named Liliana Methel, who had nursed many of the injured passengers like a mother. The 19 remaining survivors eventually managed to escape from the rubble of the avalanche, only to have to retreat back into the fuselage for another three days when a blizzard descended and trapped the survivors together with the bodies of the deceased. When they were finally able to emerge once again, they began to plot their escape. Three more deaths would occur over the course of the next month, leaving only 16 still alive. The remaining survivors came to the realization that the only way to climb over the mountain would be on the western rim of the glacier cirque. However, such an expedition would be impossible unless they found a way to survive the freezing night temperatures. 23-year-old Fernando Parada would write, The nights are cold enough to kill us, and we know better than to expect shelter on the open slopes. We needed a way to survive the long nights without freezing, and the quilted insulation from the tail of the plane gave us our solution. We realized that by folding the quilt in half and stitching the edges together, we could create an insulating sleeping bag large enough for the three of us to sleep in. With the heat from our three bodies trapped by the insulation, we might be able to survive even the deadliest of nights. On the 12th of December of 1972, Roberto Canessa, Fernando Perrada, and Antonio Vizentin set out on a hike over the mountain in order to try and reach civilization in Chile. Given the pilot's dying statement that they had overflown Curico, they estimated they were near the western edge of the Andes, and thus decided to head west. They had no rock climbing gear, no area map, no compass, and certainly no climbing experience. The thin oxygen air made it all the more difficult. They quickly realized that their expedition was going to take much longer than they originally suspected. Byzantine returned to the other so that Canessa and Parada would have more rations for the journey ahead. The pair would take three long and brutal days to climb to the summit of the glacier that overlooked the plane's crash site. Canessa would shout out loud, We're dead, when reaching the summit. The only thing that could be seen was snow-capped mountains in every direction as far as the eye could see. Parada was able to make out what was two lower peaks near the western horizon that were clear of snow. Parada was sure the valley was the way out of the mountains and refused to give up hope. While on the summit, Parada told Canessa, We may be walking to our deaths, but I would rather walk to meet my death than wait for it to come to me. Canessa agreed. You and I are friends, Nando. We have been through so much. Now let's go die together. 